We're looking this week at the life of Thomas Bilney, sometimes known as Little Bilney. And he was the spiritual father of the English Reformation. He was born in Norwich or near to Norwich, perhaps in the village of East Bilney, just north of Norwich, in the year 1495, in the reign of Henry VII. And from childhood, he loved books, he had a ready mind, and he was soon enrolled as a resident in Trinity College in Cambridge, Trinity Hall in Cambridge. And he was there to study civil and canon law. Cambridge then was very different to what it is today, of course. And in fact, it was a place where uh, it was very cold, many uh, icy winters. And it was also known for its outbreaks of typhus and malaria and grinding poverty, a very different place to today. And it was also renowned at that time, certainly around 1514, for the arrival of the Dutch Renaissance scholar called Erasmus. And he would soon publish his Greek New Testament, uh, the one that Tyndale would later use in the English Bible. The early part of Bilney's life seems to have been marked by a series of spiritual struggles, much like those of Martin Luther, where he was trying to find peace with God, relief from his sin and from his sense of guilt before God. And you remember those struggles that Martin Luther had uh, with that sense of guilt. He couldn't be rid of his guilt. And so Bilney, in likewise, in like manner, he also turned to good works. These were things like fastings and watchings, penances and masses, purchasing of pardons. But all these were powerless to relieve that sense of sin that weighed so heavy upon Bilney's heart. He said, I should utterly have been in despair. Yet Bilney read the New Testament when Erasmus published it. And he said, at last, I heard speak of Jesus and found in the epistles of Paul what he had so longed for in vain. At the first reading, as well I remember, I chanced upon this sentence of St. Paul, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That was Bilney's precious text from God's word and it transformed his heart. He said, this one sentence did exhilarate my heart. Immediately I felt a marvelous comfort and quietness insomuch as my bruised bones leapt for joy. Marcus Lone, in his uh, book, The Masters of the English Reformation, he said, the doctrines of justification by faith, of the worldliness, sorry, of the worthlessness of human efforts without Christ, of the vanity of a merely external religion of rites and ceremonies, became for Bilney, as for so many others of his generation and since, the starting points of a new life with much brighter hopes. You can go to uh, Corpus College in Cambridge and see Bilney's Bible. And if you do so, apparently, I haven't seen it myself, but it is annotated throughout. He studied the scriptures. He's thought to have not slept for more than four hours a night. He labored in study. He couldn't abide 
swearing, or dainty singing. But although Bilney was by nature a shy and gentle man, the light of truth within him could not be hid. He was a very sincere believer, and soon among those of the early uh, 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 of the early English reformers there in Cambridge, he became a leader among them. They recognized his sincerity and love uh, for the gospel. And these friends, Bilney, won for Christ by his blameless life, zealous learning, and above all, his heartfelt yearnings for the well-being of their precious souls. At heart, he was an evangelist in his personal relationships. It was not long after that, through George Stafford, Robert Barnes, who was later also to be a martyr at Norwich, a fearless man and mighty in the scriptures, was won to Christ through the life-giving gospel and stainless testimony of these godly friends. They met night after night in the shelter of the White Horse Inn, which soon became regarded by those hostile to them as little Germany, in reference, of course, to the doctrines of Luther, which they loved. Miles Coverdale, perhaps even William Tyndale, uh, who'd come from Oxford to Cambridge in 1516, uh, most likely joined with them for fellowship. One of the younger members looked back in later years on the loveliness of the Christian devotion and fellowship. And he wistfully recalled, so oft as I was in their company, methought I was quietly placed in the glorious new Jerusalem. It was the glad morning of the Reformation, but dark shadows would soon fall upon their paths. The most famous of Bilney's converts was still outside of the kingdom of Christ, in the darkness of superstition, though a brilliant mind, Hugh Latimer's mind was blinded with those superstitions. He was a fellow of Clare College in Cambridge and, and was by 1522 one of only 12 preachers who were licensed to preach anywhere throughout the realm. And so when George Stafford gave some lectures uh, to large crowds on the text of the Holy Bible, Latimer, who was uh, really full of popish zeal, he could not abide those lectures and spitefully denounced Stafford as willing the youth of Cambridge in no wise to believe him. He soon after set out to attack Luther's colleague Melanchthon, who had dared to suggest that the teaching of the Cambridge doctors must be tested against scripture. Like Saul of Tarsus, Latimer pursued the newly converted men, pitting all his intellectual powers against the truth. But one small man was listening to Latimer's intemperate denunciation of Melanchthon, who detected it was full of zeal, but without knowledge. In Fox's Book of Martyrs, Fox tells us, this man was stricken with a brotherly pity towards him, and bethought by what means he might best win this zealous, ignorant brother to the true knowledge of Christ. It was only little Bilney, listening, who said of himself that he would never do anything great in the service of the Lord. But suddenly he realized if he won the soul of that great man, Latimer, what could he do then for the service of God? So Bilney sought out Latimer and in his mild, yet earnest manner, asked Latimer for him to hear his confession and administer absolution or forgiveness for his sins. 
And so, of course, Latimer believed that uh, Bilney was a penitent who was returning to the fold of the Catholic doctrine. And so Latimer eagerly seized the opportunity to hear Bilney's confession. So there, in spring or summer 1524, a pale-faced, small man with wasted features laid bare his poor soul before the great learned doctor and powerful preacher. He spoke with touching simplicity of his own story of conflict with sin, of anguish of heart, how he'd gone about seeking health and healing for his soul from the very church physicians recommended by Latimer, and only found it in the New Testament doctrine of uh, of uh, the, the, the New Testament doctrine of forgiveness through faith. And so there was Bilney and his New Testament fell open on his lap and it opened up at those precious words that he so loved that we find in 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So the Holy Spirit was so at work at that moment in the heart of Latimer that he laid claim upon that great doctor. His soul had been stormed by that still, small voice of the Lord. Feelings too deep for words awoke within him. Latimer later said, Bilney desired me for God's sake to hear his confession. I did so, and I learned more than before in many years. Master Bilney was the instrument whereby God called me to knowledge of myself, knowledge of my sin, knowledge of Christ and his forgiveness. For I may thank him next to God for that knowledge that I have in the word of God. And so that verse unlocked Latimer's heart as it had done Bilney's. In Bilney's company, Latimer quickly grew in grace and they were often together walking around the lanes and fields of Cambridge. And it was even said of uh, uh, Castle Hill that it became Heretic's Hill because they were so often seen together talking deep in conversation. Latimer asked forgiveness of Stafford, and he spent many happy hours in the White Horse Inn meetings. He forsook his studies in the school, found a new authority in the Word of God, and began to preach the gospel with great boldness and power. But little Bilney remained in the background, content to see more able speakers take the public floor. While still shy before men, he was bold before God's throne of grace, and his heart was full of zeal for Christ. He sought out the poor and the outcast, tended to lepers, wrapping them in unclean sheets, in clean sheets, and telling them of Christ. He went into prisons to seek out sinners. He took Latimer with him on occasion, for he was ever visiting prisoners and sick folk. This was little Bilney. In 1527, he commenced a preaching tour in East Anglia. And he went with Thomas Arthur, and they preached and proclaimed with apostolic zeal boldly the gospel. Such action soon attracted the attention of priests and friars who took every opportunity to ridicule him and on occasions even drag him from his pulpit. Each time Bilney challenged his opponents and his comments were all carefully noted and laid to his future reckoning with the church. And on 28th of May, 1527, he was arrested while preaching in Ipswich, in the church of Williston, 
Uh, he exhorted the people to put away their gods of silver and gold and leave off offering to them candle, wax, money, or anything else. And that, when he said the litany, he said, pray you only to God or to no saints. And when he came to Sancta Maria, etc., or O Saint Mary, pray for us, he said, stay there. They put Thomas in a cell in the Tower of London, but made a mistake. Somehow they left the door open. Cuthbert Tunstall, who was the Bishop of London and a royal advisor, he had control of the proceedings that were to follow against Bilney. He was most reluctant to find Bilney guilty, and he endeavoured to persuade him to recant. The officials played a very subtle game. What they did was they encourage some of his so-called friends who would come in to visit him, try and dissuade him from becoming a martyr. And under intense pressure, he, he buckled and signed a renunciation before the officials who had arrested him. The following day was a Sunday. They paraded him through the uh, streets of London, all the way to St. Paul's Cathedral. And when he got there, he listened to a sermon that denounced his heresy. And just outside the cathedral doors, they had a stack of Tyndale's Bibles. It would be his job to ignite the Bibles and burn them. That event shattered Bilney's soul, so troubled and provoked his spirit that he made up his mind that he was going to get arrested again. And in 1531, in Norwich, England, he accomplished just that. Though he was tried in London, he was sentenced to be executed in the city of Norwich because it was there that he held his greatest influence. And on August the 8th, 1531, he spent his last night on earth in a dark, damp prison cell. This is what happened that night. They had a table spread where he was sitting, eating his last meal. Five of his closest friends came to him to try and comfort him and encourage him and console him. They were led by Matthew Parker, who would later become the Archbishop of Canterbury and, uh, under the reign of Elizabeth I. And they gave him words to try to strengthen him, but he didn't need strengthening. He was totally committed to die for Christ. Had they offered him a pardon, it would have disappointed him. They spoke about the flames that would be called by the Spirit of God to him to try to encourage him as he quietly finished his meal. But when he was done, he pushed away the plate, pulled his Bible over to where they were sitting, and in their dumb silence, unexplained, he simply rested his elbow on the table, extended his index finger, and held it over the flame of a candle. And he held it there until his finger burnt to the bone. He then looked down at the open Bible, which he'd just been reading, and he read aloud, Isaiah 42, verse 2, When thou walkest through the fire, you shall not be burnt. And he commented that to burn for any other reason than dying for Christ would burn. But with Christ in the flames, they wouldn't burn. It was in that frame of mind he spent his last night on earth. The next day, as they took him from the cell, they crossed Bishop's Bridge, and he ran to embrace the stake. And there he thanked God for having a second opportunity to die for Christ. In Fox's Book of Martyrs, he records his martyrdom like this. The officers put reeds and faggots about his body and set fire on the reeds, which made a very great flame, which sparkled and deformed the visor of his face. 
he holding up his hands and knocking about his breast, crying sometimes Jesus, sometimes credo or I believe, which flame was blown away from him by the violence of the wind, which was that day and two or three days before notably great, in which it was said that the fields were marvelously plagued by the loss of corn, and so for a little pause he stood without flame, the flame departing and recoursing thrice, ere the wood took strength to be the sharper to consume him. And then he gave up the ghost, and his body being withered, bowed down with, upon the chain. Then one of the officers with his halberd smote out the staple in the stake behind him and suffered his body to fell uh, to, to fall rather into the bottom of the fire, laying wood upon it, and so he was consumed. Thomas Bilney taught the English reformers how to live for Christ, but also how to die for them. Well, what can we learn tonight from the life of Thomas Bilney. It's such a touching account and one I very much love. The first thing we can learn from his life is the preciousness of the gospel, especially the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and that Christ came into the world to save sinners that wonderful doctrine that we have a saviour who came and gave his life for sinners. But it's only by faith in him that we can gain that salvation. Faith in that work at Calvary, that we can gain that new life in him. It's a, a saying that's faithful and worthy of all acceptation, and therefore we should proclaim it boldly. So the first thing we learn from Thomas Bilney is the preciousness of the gospel and that doctrine of justification by faith. The second thing we can learn is that we should live for Christ in personal one-to-one -one witness with our neighbors, with our friends. Bilney was a man who loved his friends, who watched out for the souls of those who were near and dear to him, but also acquaintances of him, uh, of his, and he loved them, and he cared for their souls, and he spoke to them about the gospel, and they observed his life. How much more we should, should be careful in the way that we live, that others will observe how we live. And do they see in us anything of Christ? The third thing we, we can learn from Bilney is his boldness to proclaim Christ. You remember how he was a shy man, and yet... He went out preaching boldly on his tour of East Anglia. And that's a lesson for us. Are we ashamed of this gospel? Or have we got it in our heart to proclaim it with great fervor and zeal? May God give that to us. But then the fourth thing we can learn we may be little like Bilney. You remember he said that he didn't think he'd amount to much in the service of Christ. And we may feel that also. And we may be discouraged. And yet we can look at the life of Bilney and see how the Lord used this shy man and made him mighty for the gospel. But then also we can see how Bilney loved Christ more than his own life. What a witness that is to us in our materialistic 
generation and how we are all uh, challenged by the death of the martyrs, uh, both in the early Christian period in Rome and in our own land. Are we prepared to give our life for Christ? Well, Bilney also teaches us that you can be restored. If you have dishonored your Lord, if you have uh, despised the privileges or perhaps not really taken the opportunities that you should have done even as a Christian and served the Lord. Bilney knew the pain of failure and yet the Lord gave him a second chance and that is our saviour. When we come to him with our failures we know ourselves to be unprofitable servants, but he has promised to restore us. If we come to him, he will in no wise cast us out. He can restore his servants and make them useful, even after periods of bitter failure. Well, this then is the lives, uh, the, the lessons we can learn from the life of Thomas Bilney. They loved not their lives unto the death. May God bless to us the memory of this servant of Christ. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God and loving Father, how we give thanks this evening that we come unto a Saviour who is gracious, who receives sinners, who can restore those that have backslidden like the Apostle Peter did, who can uh, cause those who have not put their backs to the work like Mark and make them profitable. We think also of Onesimus, that slave who uh, was restored to Philemon. Lord, we pray that for love's sake we may uh, encourage those that have failed us and seek your grace, thy grace, Lord, that if we have failed, that we might come in repentance and seek again renewed help and zeal and strength to serve thee as we should in our day and generation. So we rejoice in all those faithful ones of our forebears who serve thee and some who gave their life for thee. But we pray that their example may encourage us to serve thee in our day too. Hear us then this night, pardon all amiss for Christ's sake. Amen.